Happy Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in today. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 818th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the immense pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring and a reading featuring Daniel Kalaschi, Carol Pagel, Sarah Deniz Akant, C.V. Perez, and Cole Swenson. And before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Daniel Kalaschi is an Iraqi Jewish American, a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and a former fellow at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. He's the author of three books of poetry. He's the co-founder and managing editor of Rescue Press, and he lives in Iowa City, where he directs the University of Iowa's Magid Wright Center for Writing. Carol Pagel is the author of three books of poetry and a collection of essays called Out of Nowhere Into Nothing. She is the publisher and um, editor at Rescue Press and the director of the Cleveland State University Poetry Center. She teaches poetry and nonfiction at Cleveland State University and in the Neo MFA program. Sarah Deniz Akant is a poet, educator, and performer. She's the author of three books, most recently Hyperfantasia from Rescue Press, which was a New York Times Book of the Year, among other awards. She teaches poetry as a professor of the practice at Tufts University and co-curates the Khan Yama Khan reading series in Brooklyn. C.V. Perez is a multidisciplinary designer and the creative director of Rescue Press. Over the last 10 years, C.V. has produced over 100 books, journals, and magazines with his most recent work for the Hopkins Review winning CELJ's 2022 Phoenix Award. He holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he also guest lectures. And our host today, Cole Swenson, is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and a collection of critical essays. A former Guggenheim Fellow, she has been a finalist for the National Book Award and has been awarded the Iowa Poetry Prize, among other recognitions. She's also translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French and won the 2004 Penn USA Award in Literary Translation. We're so thrilled to have you all on the NSC today to talk about the amazing work of Rescue Press. And with that, uh, I'll pass it over to you, Cole. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming. And as always, big thanks to the rail team. Uh, so Eleanor, Chloe, Fong, and everybody there. Um, Publishing in Transit is part of the new social environment series. And we're just thrilled to have a format, a platform to acknowledge all the amazing people who do the behind the scenes work that really is responsible for poetry in um, North America. So um, thanks, Rail, for giving us the chance. And thank you all for doing the work that you do. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start by hearing some poetry. And we're going to start with Sarah. And then we're going to go on to Danny. And then we'll go into our conversation. So uh, Sarah, take us away. Thank you, Cole, and um, thanks all of you for joining uh, Brooklyn Rail and um, my wonderful press rescue. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read from Hyperfantasia. Um, I have started doing a little bit of prefacing, um, which is to say this collection um, is a group of a sequence of poems. Um, I consider them uh, 14 line um, 
sort of sonnet hybrid broken uh, form pieces. Um, and they follow this named femme figure, Fanta, uh, through all sorts of voices. Um, so there's a lot of performance inside of it. Um, and the first voice that I start with is sort of this robotic doll voice. But actually before that, now I remember, I'm going to read the real intro intros, intro intros uh, poem. One, two, three, began. They call you something before you arrive, a fantasy. And don't you wanna? Yes, yes, I do, the ghost. Yes, yes, when I was born, my mother said, she's beautiful, but she has no neck. Now I'm crouching, tweezing the hars from my one wild Turkish nipple. And what will you do with your one wild, precious life? I am trying to get enough of the dim fluorescent light. And so now I begin. Hello. I'm Fanta, your personal expert on style. I just know we'll be the best of friends. Press yes to set my clock. Time to set my clock. Seven o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning. Today's word is hyperfantasia. That means something is extremely vivid, as in Fanta in the morning, Fanta in the evening, Fanta at supper time. But hey, even in the coldest dreams, I held him. I felt afraid of what I must embrace around us to make room. The threat of his body wrapped itself in a carcass while the necromantra, necromantic soundtrack played on loop. It said, hello, I'm Fanta, your personal expert on style. I just know we'll be the best of friends. So that sort of begins the book. Um, and then I have all of these poems inside of it. So I'm going to just dive in with um, one of the longer groups of 14 liners. Let me crush on the dove that sits at the end of this poem. Let me trample my naked heart into her nest. Let me only write about orchards and orphans and explode. I don't drag sand in the bed with the soles of my feet. I make it all here on my own. I'm a crusty slit sponge for the sun. There are, however, a few things that I want. Sharp needles pressing deep in my pores while all those egg babies come in strong. I wanna grab all the hair at the back of my throat and tie it up in a bow. Instead of throat, I want to say trot. I want a blustery dove flying straight to my palm. Outside my window, every dove begins with eyes. Every boy begins as a piece of jellyfish flopping in the tide. In the meantime, I was born in a terrorist's house that they called an all-girls school. Every room was filled with fluffy bagels and perfect white girl skins. Every girl went on to write a famous book about those bagels on their way to the nut house, which is college. When you're not a jellyfish, you're a whore, so you're beautiful. That's what we were taught. 
Meanwhile, I want to cut off my big Turkish nose and lie face down in his old football color. I'm tired before I arrive. The beat up VHS of our wedding is trapped inside of the parrot that my therapist keeps locked up in her office closet. The parrot is having a frenzy. The world hands me the word oriental and I begin to eat its parasites as if that's fun. In my dream, there's a man hiding inside the tank of the porta potties at our yoga retreat. When it's on the news, my dream comes true. My name is Sarah, Sarai, Sarah, or Saro. Saro is a sultan. She is definitely no pharaoh. I weep in my dream because I'm already awoke. At breakfast, I learn to say grace. I say grace for your anxiety, grace for your envy, grace for your money, your language. I hate it. Truly, I'm sorry. Let me kiss you while I hold this bitter bite of butter in my mouth. As I said, it was winter. It was the return of the Sultan Saro. Meanwhile, that dove will have grown into a robot. Good boy. That is why. He is so perfect. And that is why he is so pure and sharp. Thank you. I think that's probably five minutes. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. What a great start. And now, uh, Danny, if you want to take over and continue the good start. Sure. Thanks so much, Cole. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks to everyone at the rail for having us. Really excited uh, to be a part of this discussion. Um, I'm going to read a couple pieces from um, my new book that's coming out, um, my fourth book of poems uh, from the University of Wisconsin Press this coming spring. Um, the book is called The Story of Your Obstinate Survival. Um, and I'm going to read a couple pieces. So here we go. The imminent decline of everything we've understood to be what governs our privileged daily lives. I don't think you will leave me for the neighbor because I actually think you will leave me for him. I think you will leave me for the neighbor because I would leave me for him. I am hard to live with, and this pandemic has a medic made us in sudden need of. I sit around the house, its bones a nest for me to wrestle in and complain about my skin and back and order unrequired items from the internet to conscribe my vanity toward the benefit of crisis. So when the neighbor stops by for a socially distant cocktail, his recent separation porched in his flowering eyes, his daughter's birthday parade recorded and available to view from the safety of our living room like the television binges we return to at night instead of finally reading the news when he arrives and sits on our poorly tamed retaining wall. I see the dirt in his fingernails and his unset hair and watch you smile at his ability to weather it. His wife gone in a fit, his job cut like a bad student film. And yet, even in this dispassionate arena of unoriginal programming, he is here in our yard offering us his extra toilet paper. This kindness is best described by your look later as the two of you text about joining a CSA. In a teleconference paid for by our employer's generous medical coverage, my therapist says that it would do me well to sell off my discomfort and confront these crashes in advance. The Wi-Fi cuts out, but for a moment, it looks like she is putting on lip gloss so we have something to get dressed for. You 
below me in the kitchen aren't thinking of the neighbor or if you are, you are good at not making it the whale in our shared living space. But I am thinking of the neighbor, his red mailbox, his blue Jetta, his youthful catastrophic year in the infinite time he has ahead of him to make like it never happened. We feel terrible that the matzah we gave him wasn't approved to be used at the sacramental meal. It said so on the box, but he wasn't bothered. Don't you see why we should leave me? And I'm gonna read uh, one more, uh, dedicate this to both uh, to both um, Doug Powell um, and uh, a wonderful uh, artist that we lost yesterday. Um, dance party for the end of the world. Here in this drag city ain't nothing going on but the rent. I don't want to be a freak, but I can't help myself. I'm alive with love, tripping on the moon, coming out of hiding all evergreen and searching for sunset people. Right on target, Doug, I got the feeling to use it up and wear it out, to get away from the visitors burning with fire, and maybe this time dim all the lights right in the night and run away too blind to see it. I know there's something going on, a private joy a new attitude of brighter days that leaves me feeling lucky lately. The power shame, f shame free, wicked game I love to love. Mercy, I got my education in cha-cha heels, bolero, unexpected lovers, and IOU souvenirs. More and more, the hitman, higher SOS, fire in the sky. In my house, the dominatrix sleeps tonight and you are in my system, walking on music showing out. Take your time, enjoy the silence. Remember what you like, angel boy, one night in a lifetime, a walk in the park. My heart goes bang thinking of you. Can't help it, it's the meaning in the bush, together, in electric dreams. And I'll uh, stop there. Thanks all. I should have said that was for Tina Turner. I just got all worked up emotionally. <laughs> Thank you both. Wonderful readings. Uh, and again, we always like to start with the actual work in the air and kind of underscore the fact that so many of the people who make poetry possible in this country, on this continent, in this world, are themselves poets. So uh, thanks for that reminder and that really great demonstration of it. And so now I know you have some images that we're going to start with. And um, we, we talked a little bit about the notion of community and how important the community notion is to the press, how it really started in community. And so uh, having some photos that show that I think is a great way to start. So I will shut up and let you all tell us about them. Thanks, Cole. Um, Carol, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. We can we can kind of do this together if you want. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So I just I, so for those who who are just joining the call. So I'm Danny Klotchy. I'm one of the founders of uh, Rescue Press, along with Carol Pagel. Uh, I'm sitting in my office in Iowa City. Um, Carol, where are you? I'm in Milwaukee right now. Ooh, fa that's fascinating because we started <laughs> nice. Rescue Press when we were uh, in Milwaukee. Um, Carol and I knew each other as undergrads. We met when we were um, studying at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I was very fortunate to meet um, a number of writers and poets that were uh, inspirational to me um, and influential to me in my career. And as we continued through grad school, um, Carol and I were able to really keep that connection going. 
uh, and we got this idea um, to start a press. So Carol, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, you can correct me if I miss anything, but essentially, you know, we had just sort of come from Iowa City, come out of grad school. We were both living and teaching in Milwaukee at the time. Um, and uh, some of you might know that in Milwaukee, there is a very beautiful bookstore called Woodland Pattern. Um, they have a poetry focus and really an experimental poetry focus um, and even better, a small press experimental poetry focus. And so, um, you know, we were in proximity, I think, for the first time in my life to this entire lineage of, as Cole put it, you know, poets making poetry happen for other people. Um, Woodland Pattern just has like a huge selection of small press work going back, um, you know, for the last, I don't know, like 80 or so years, chapbooks, pamphlets, little one-offs, um, lots of great, you know, contemporary small press literature. And at the time, um, you know, we were, we were both adjuncting teaching, creative writing, and, um, you know, specifically I had been in a, in a PhD program for a moment and I, I left it to teach at an art school which was really energizing to me. And I think Danny and I both had this feeling, um, we were writing, trying to get books out, of wanting to, um, to do something, to make something, uh, you know, as a lot of you on this, um, on this Zoom know who are writers, it can be a lonely business. There's a lot of sitting in a room by yourself. And one of the things that I was really inspired by specifically from the um the artists at the school that i was teaching at and danny had taught at um was just this sense that they were always making things together they were always collaborating they were always sort of stopping by each other's studios and lending each other um you know equipment or materials or what have you and i think that you know we thought well what would what could we do that's collaborative and active and has sort of a DIY artsy spirit that has to do with the thing that we know about, um, which is writing and poetry. And so we thought to start a press and some of these pictures you're looking at are from the early years and it's, um, you know, we won't name everyone involved here, but um, a lot of the pictures have the other, the other um, people who, the other editors who work at um, Rescue Press. So that's Alyssa Perry. And just to mention in a photo, a couple back, Hillary Plum and Zach Savage, who now run the Open Prose series for us. So they all came along pretty early in it all. Um, yeah, we had, I love these photos of just, you know, I think that there, we picked out a bunch that hopefully show the spirit of this little community that kind of sprang right away from the press. So we reached out to a couple friends at the beginning. Yeah, there's Zach and Hillary. <laughs> um, Alyssa's in a couple of the pictures too. And um, Zach Isom, who used to work with us, is in a couple of those. And um, uh, yeah, like right away, you know, we reached out to folks who we knew had really great manuscripts that hadn't been picked up. And we just kind of um, we began knowing absolutely nothing about anything. We, you know, and I like to, whenever I talk um, to groups, I like to emphasize how very little we knew <laughs> at the beginning. Um, just to say, you know, when we tried to figure out how to start a press, we found ourselves reaching out to this broader community of small press editors and publishers, and people were great, you know, they would give us tips, um, on where to like print a book or how to make a contract or something. And, um, and our friends were part of it right from the beginning, you know, friends who we'd been close with before, or just maybe like acquaintances whose work we liked, people sort of jumped in. So it was also a nice, you know, uh, what is it? Danny, if you build it, they will come sort of situation. <laughs> um, yeah, do you wanna, is, is there more about the beginning? I mean, I was just gonna add, so here's a, a photo that's in front of you that's Shane McRae, Mark Ray, Andrea Rexilius, Madeline McDonald, and Sky McNeil. Um, and these are all friends, colleagues, artists that we are 
fortunate to know. When we started Rescue, we had the idea, as Carol said, we didn't know what we were doing. We had an idea of sharing with the world because we'd been inspired by communities that meant a lot to us, Provincetown, Iowa City, um, Chicago, uh, Madison, and then Milwaukee, obviously. Um, Mark Ray is a writer who, uh, whose work I've long been inspired by. And I knew that Mark had a manuscript that had not been picked up. And we thought we would start uh, by producing a chat book. So we drove down to Iowa City, we talked to Mark, we thought about doing it as a chat book and then realized we could just try to put out a full book. And Mark, I have to say, if anybody should be credited with the start of Rescue, uh, in many ways it's Mark because Mark trusted two people who were his friends and who believed in his art, but had no knowledge uh, or experience in publishing. And he said, sure. And he trusted us with his work. And I think Carol and I, I never want to speak for Carol, but I think I can say it here. I think we both um, took that very seriously. It's a lot for someone to trust you with something they've spent um, decades on and to give it to you and say, I trust you. So we learned a lot in a very short period of time, everything from how to talk to printers, uh, how to work with um, distributors, how to talk to reviewers and try to get the book out. And we got really lucky. We had an incredible manuscript. We had an incredible design team. Andy Mazur uh, designed our logo. He was someone we went to grad school with, or undergrad with, excuse me. Um, and when we released Mark's book, we got a quick review. Um, people wanted to learn more about us. And then Shane McRae reached out to us and said, hey, I've got these poems. Maybe you, you want to do a chat book. And we said, sure. And then Madeline had these stories and she agreed to work with us. So very quickly, we had not only a collaborative community who were eager to help us, but who trusted us. And then we had artists uh, come to us and really help us with the things that we didn't know about uh, in terms of design. And so we were very serious in our uh, attempt at editing, our very serious in our willingness to reach out to our community. And then we had these wonderful uh, team members who were willing to support that work by sending us work and also uh, designing those books and getting them out in the world. And from there, we expanded pretty quickly. We knew, especially for poets, many of you on the call might be poets, it's hard to get a book of poetry in the world. So we started something called the Black Box Poetry Prize because we didn't want to just be knocking on the doors of our friends. Uh, and so we opened up a, a, a reading period where we would take manuscripts uh, and actually take books from people that we weren't immediately connected with because we wanted to give that space back to the community. Um, over the years that expanded, we have wonderful judges, wonderful books that came out of that. Um, I, Sarah's first book uh, came to us through the black box. Um, and then we've continued to work with authors on their second and third books. Sometimes uh, we've expanded, as Carol said, into um, prose. We have a prose series now, um, which brought us books like Andrea Lawler's um, Politics, the Form of a Mortal Girl. Um, it's a picture of Andrea and Adrian, wonderful friends uh, and writers. Um, and, and again, none of that would be possible without these artists and writers trusting us without the community of readers like all of you. Uh, and then the work that we do on the back end to make sure those books uh, get into the hands of readers is something we take very seriously. Do you want to say anything about the title, how you came across Rescue Press and that amazing logo that you have? So Carol can speak to uh, uh, at least the, the name of the press. Yeah, I'll talk about that quickly because it's always, it's a slightly less interesting story than maybe one would want it to be. And I feel like the story of the logo, which CV could jump in about is, it has a longer history. Um, to be totally honest, being a poet, I just, um, I was like, what should we call a press? Press, press, rest, rescue. <laughs> um, and then I... And then it's, you know, we since have really identified with that idea in a variety of different ways. Um, the idea of, um, you know, at the beginning, we had sort of a, a real sensibility of trying to um, work with poets who had maybe been sending around manuscripts for a pretty long time, you know? So that idea of rescue, we also, um, you know, we, we say a lot about the ways that that literature has rescued us and has, you know, um, the ways that our authors have that this like sort of ongoing, chaotic, tumultuous, beautiful um, community, you know, that that kind of like the all being in it together rescueness of it. So I would say that um, though it came from a rhyme, <laughs> it really has 
it's come to mean a lot to me over time in ways that I couldn't have predicted at the beginning. Right. And for the for the logo, CV can chime in on this, but early on, again, we worked with um, Sky, we worked with uh, Andy Mazur, um, and we had Andy create our original logo. And Andy, like many designers, he had come up with a couple versions that were pretty on the nose as it relates to rescue. And even the final version that he gave us still had a, a sort of red cross element to it. Um, but I remember it was my first experience with working with a designer and I sort of didn't know what was happening. And then he said in an email, he said, here are two designs and then here's a wild card. And I think both Carol and I immediately were like, we like the wild card. And it's a vulture, maybe an eagle uh, with a scuba diver attached to a rope. Um, what, who is rescuing what? It's, it's confusing and beautiful and uh, I, I love it. Um, but CV has sense given it a little bit of a um of an update uh so cv i don't know if you want to chime in anything about how the logo is used now yeah happily um hi everybody my name is cv perez uh as uh, the team mentioned i'm the creative director of rescue press uh, and have been for about 10 years but rescue press was founded in 2009 so there's that first tranche of of books and things that um i wasn't a part of including that that logo so as, as carol and danny mentioned um, Andy uh, designed this gorgeous uh, logo. I actually had not heard that it was a wild card before, which I love because that wild card has that sort of throwing something random into the mix has become a sort of a core part of our process for as strange as that might sound. Uh, and um, that logo, the Rescue Press logo, I can either confirm or deny what kind of bird it is. Um, However, it is a it is a bird carrying a scuba diver. It is extremely unusual and very unfriendly. If you're trying to shrink it down, if you're trying to um, get away with it in a couple of environments. So after I sort of inherited that mark, we kind of reconceptualized it so it could do a number of different things. And then in 20 and 2021, when we relaunched uh, our website, uh, a amazing illustrator and animator named Rohan Patrick McDonald uh, at my at my request animated um, the logo. So I'm the creative director, but I don't do sort of all of the, the design necessarily myself. And this is one instance where I always wanted that mark to be brought to life. It was begging to be in motion. Um, and I'm so glad that we achieved it. Uh, and I think it's lovely. Great. Thank you. That's, I think, a great, and all the visuals launch us off, um, and again, with this sense of the community that's always the motivating and um, sort of energizing factor. Um, I heard, uh, Danny, you said, used the term demystification as one of the goals of the press, and the idea of demystifying the whole process of publication. And I thought, I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit, and then maybe hear from Sarah in terms of what it feels like from the point of view of a writer to work with a press that's focused on that notion. Yeah, and, and Carol, please feel free to jump in. Uh, Carol mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we didn't know a ton. We knew a lot about um, poetry. Uh, we are, Carol and I are both really um, uh, broad readers. We read a lot of fiction, a lot of experimental work, um, but we had never produced a, a, a physical book before we started working with Mark and started this press. As we've gone through that process no, a number of times, we want to be as transparent as we can with both um, people that are submitting work to us, but also with our authors. Um, Carol and I have also both worked with uh, our presses ourselves and have worked uh, and heard from colleagues that are working with presses where some of this stuff isn't clear. And so we try to demystify that process and make sure that everything from what is the publishing cycle going to look like? What is the um, uh, production schedule going to look like? What are we asking of our authors so that they know what to prepare for? Um, what's going to happen once the book goes into production? What's going to happen when it's done? Just because a book gets sent to the printer our work isn't done. We want to help get that book into the world by helping set up readings, by help announcing stuff on social media. Um, and so we try to walk our authors through that. And we also try to make sure that that's clear to um, our audience as well. Uh, I try to be really quick when people are emailing us to ask us questions uh, from a bookstore to a, a author who's interested. Um, and so we're, I think, trying to approach this as 
something that we do, something that we now have expertise in, but it's not something that there's only one way to do it and that there's only one, um, one person who holds all the keys to that knowledge. Uh, another thing that we'll gladly do uh, is if anyone ever wants to talk to us, like the wonderful uh, work we're, you guys are doing at the rail right now, we want to share those, uh, those things that we've learned so that other presses like we were have that information. I'll never forget when we started Rescue Press, uh, I got on the phone with a wonderful poet and publisher, Nick Twemlow and Robin Schiff, who were doing Canarium at the time with Josh. And um, I asked them, how, how do you do a contract? How do you get books in a library? Uh, and Nick was so kind with his time. He didn't have to do any of that. Um, but he got on the phone, he answered questions. Um, we put me in touch with people that could help with all of this stuff. And that was just community helping community. And so we want to, to be that for the next group of publishers coming up behind us. Right, yeah. And again, Sarah, if you'd like to join in and say what it looks like from the, or feels like from the point of view of an author working with this attitude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny, just as you were speaking, Cole, I remembered that the way that I found out, I think I probably did know about rescue, um, but I didn't know that I had a book of poems <laughs> um, at, for that first book. The first book that I did with them was um, Babette, which won the um, Black Box Poetry prize in 2014, 2015. It came out in 2015. <clears throat> and Cole, you sent an email. I mean, just speaking to community, you sent an email um, that I got that said they're reading for this prize. And I said to myself, oh my God, that's so amazing. Um, <laughs> do I have anything? And I remember I was actually uh, in this apartment and I I just looked through all of my poems, all of my like half started manuscripts and um, little uh, ditties and then longer things and things that I've been working on for a long time. And I was like, you know what, maybe um, I can put something together in this next week. And so I, I put these poems together and um, didn't expect much from it. Um, I don't, it was not called Babette at that time. I think I titled it Ghost and um, misspelled, which is important. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I mean, I also want to emphasize like the speed and um, the ease with uh, how, how working with rescue has really been like, there's been almost zero glitches from the author standpoint like uh I don't know when I sent it in and when I got a reply but um it was it was so human um the email that I got from Carol saying that um you know they had chosen my book um and I was so blown away but the the human contact was like right there from the get-go it was so um moving and just felt exactly like the book itself in this strange way. Um, and so I think that uh, I wasn't looking for that, but I could tell from the beginning and I didn't know, I didn't, I don't think I knew them at the time, um, but I could tell I was immediately interacting with friends who understood the language and the sort of like internal sensibility of what I, had been doing for years and then like you know sort of quickly in a week had this like burst of energy towards um and they talked about the book in language that I hadn't thought of before um and it was it was really exciting and then you know the second book um I can also speak to that process uh I I was I was sending that was a different situation I was sending a manuscript around it was a lot more like a rescue situation <laughs> I mean both were but um I was sending a book around and uh I also had um bits and pieces of manuscripts different manuscripts um I needed a little bit of encouragement and direction um and advice at that time about where to go with the um with the book. And so that's what ended up being hyperphantasia. 
Um, but I, that was a phone call because I already knew them. Um, and that was very much felt between poets and friends in a professional sense. Um, so I was really lucky to um, have these professional poet friends who um, were also capable of putting um, a book out. And, I, you know, that process was even smoother because the, the press had already been going for so long at that point. I mean, between my first book and my second book, I think there was five or seven years, seven years. <laughs> um, and it was just clear because um, I was trying to also decide where to publish um, this second book of, of poems. And it was clear that I was just like so comfortable and in such good hands with um, my poet friends over at Rescue. Uh, and I can talk more about like what happened after that, but yeah. Right, that like that's great to hear the other you know other side of it. I but even as I say the other side of it, I think one of the things that's maybe unique or particularly successful about Rescue Press is it's not a matter of sides. Everybody's working together toward the same end. And in that vein, I'm thinking about the importance of the book as an object. And I wonder if we can sort of segue to you, CV, and uh, tell us about what it's like to try and get uh, a unique object that responds to each manuscript. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we make books, but I it's more that we make things that resemble books is how I kind of think of it. Our design process begins with me receiving a, a manuscript and um, I will read the manuscript and the authors are asked up front a lot of broad sort of tonal questions uh, and I don't read that until I'm done reading the manuscript because it's really important that I form an independent idea of what the thing looks or functions like we're we're talking beyond just the cover you know and and just the size um, there are a couple of examples, some of them we've included in the slideshow of, of books that we felt resembled this um, collaboration particularly well. Um, there are instances in uh, Gravity Well, which is Mark's third book, for instance, Mark Ray's third book, um, where uh, there's a, a moon, uh, the, the moon phasing um, is, a, is a large sort of thematic uh, through line. Of, of that collection. And that was something that I had proposed to Mark. And likewise, there are also a lot of design decisions that come from the editors. And there are a lot of book covers that would look completely different if I was left to my own devices. And so, and actually I wanted to mention this one example, um, a, a project we're working on now, um, an author uh, had a dream last night about something regarding their, their cover. And I think we're gonna do it. Um, that is a legitimate design input, I think, to Rescue Press. Um, of course, when we say book as object, we're trying to triangulate three sort of separate and somewhat exclusive categories. There's, of course, a product that needs to perform in a marketplace and be read <laughs> and sold. Then there's um, contemporary tastes or there's sort of the expectations of that genre Certain genres have different expectations of them visually. How do you catch a reader from just the spine? Uh, and then also the authorial intent, which I think is what separates what we do a little bit from other presses. I call what we do a cooperative bookmaking practice. And we try to position authors in the center of that, take what they want it to be and work outward. Uh, and there's a lot, I say that um, we try to make each book beautiful in exactly, which I want to credit to the late great Marvin Bell. He has a lovely poem to Dorothy. Uh, where that line is from it begins you are not beautiful exactly you are beautiful in exactly and so we have authors who come in and they say i want this to be disturbing to the reader and the goal is then not to necessarily be um, the most beautiful book in the world but it's to it's to channel that authorial intent It's to channel that um yeah that intent that i keep coming back to that idea that's really important to me i see myself as a translator there's nothing i won't try but there are things that i might not do successfully um and i think that's really important we're not tethered to any specific aesthetic and we don't um we don't we never do just one version of anything there's always you know i i do between 40 to 60 covers for every book um the author will see up between 5 and 15 
depending on how many variations we're doing. And they choose every step of the way. They are the ones choosing where to go next. Um, and that's really important. And then there are other examples in, in the pictures where some of the books, um, Sarah Miners has like a poster. She's holding a, a poster in a frame from, from one of the books. And Our Dark Academia is another publication we just released where there's um, sort of interactive worksheet elements and like a quiz and stuff inside of there as part of that experience. So we try to really take that broad lens. Yeah. Great. Sounds, sounds like it's a fun process for you too. Oh, you, yes, yeah, it keeps me sane. I have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do, you know, as a commercial designer, you're, I'm doing a, a, a ca an optical eyewear catalog for importing wholesale to warehouses is another project I'm doing. So I get to do that, but then I get to go do a poetry collection. And and if I hadn't had Rescue as a collaboration for the last 10 years, I I would I would feel sort of listless. So it's been it's been absolutely the collaboration of a lifetime so far. Yeah, great. And um, the idea I think that many people have that publication is the end of a process. And Carol, you mentioned the other day that you see it as in fact, the beginning of something as well. And you mentioned the term generative publishing. And I, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's something, it's a term that I sort of, it took me years to figure out how to put, um, I think like, our shared editorial sensibility into language. And just maybe in the last five or six years, I've been saying generative editing and generative publishing. It's it's the best match, you know, that I've come up with so far to, to what we're trying to do. Um, and I should say there's five editors at the press right now. Um, so Hillary, uh, Hillary Plum and Zach Savage do our open prose series, which you can check out on the website. That's um, maybe eight ish years old um, and they do prose and then Alyssa Perry myself and Danny do the other books which are primarily sort of hybrid genre and um, and poetry and all the poetry so something that we've been talking about amongst ourselves and then also with the authors is this idea that uh, is it's kind of it's just a very like social and broad idea that when we take a book we take it because we want to publish it in whatever form it's in so you know we're committing to it from the beginning it's not like you have to make a bunch of changes and then we'll take it so we take a book and then you know we have a series of long conversations that happen over a period of time about what this what we see the book is as it came to us. So whoever's, you know, the point person in terms of editing will read it a couple times and usually write some sort of letter to the author saying, this is what we see in it. Like, this is how we're describing it amongst ourselves. Here's what we think this book is and here's what we think it could be. Here's our, here are editorial suggestions, like everything from like line level to ordering um, to like moving things around. And then here's like usually a couple of other bigger ideas. And sometimes those ideas are very um, silly and playful. Like, you know, do you wanna add like a workbook section into the back of your poetry book? Or do you wanna have a pull out essay? Or sometimes the ideas are questions. Like, do you feel like this is done and if not like is it great that it's not and so what should your next book be can we talk about that together <laughs> you know um there are these big sort of like rangy questions and and our sensibility is that you know we want publishing to feel as you said like a beginning to something so when we take your book you're like a part of this team and this conversation and this collaboration and we try to ask ourselves and the author, like, what else can this be? And again, sometimes that comes down to fairly traditional editing decisions. Sometimes it comes down to like generating more work. And sometimes it comes down to like things that are happening outside of the object of the, or sometimes it comes down to design as Stevie was just saying. And sometimes it has to do with things that happen outside of the 
object of the book. So like what other writing might you want to do like in conjunction with the process of going through the edits or publishing the book in the world? Or how might this translate to other forms or medias? How might it become a performance piece? Um, what might we want to do with the book? You know, um, do we want to like leave it at a bus stop or, you know, have some part of it that you can rip out? You know, like those are object questions. So I think that um, for me, that's increasingly been the like energizing and exciting part of of doing this work. I don't know um, if you know if I would be as interested in in doing this kind of work long term if um, if every aspect of it wasn't creative, and if every aspect of it wasn't collaborative. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Really well put. Uh, and you're making me think about the way in which the press, and particularly rescue, overflows the the book or the mm -hmm. narrow notion of what a literary work is or whatever. And I'm thinking in particular overflow in two directions. One, you mentioned performance. Mm -hmm. Can, how is this book going to be perhaps a performative moment also? And then the other one is kind of overflowing the sort of more normative publishing goals of the book. And I'm thinking particularly um, in the new chapbook series, the Flare editions, and their very interesting, valuable social role. So maybe we can start by hearing from Sarah, uh, because I know you've done some performance work, and then segue back to talk about the Flare project. Yeah, um, I mean, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the idea of the generative editing, because as I was saying, you know, for both of these books that I did, um, I really did need some um, and want some direction. Uh, and I have a particular style and sensibility. Um, and I have a kind of like, I'm very nitpicky, but I'm indecisive. <laughs> um, and so I I just really valued um, everything that Carol's talking about there, uh, getting a, a long-ish, you know, just the perfect length editorial letter um, with the with the feedback um, from the manuscript and then line edits that really struck a balance. Um, if I'm just recalling with with hyperphantasia, you know, of um, editorial work, but also uh, just the poetic sensibility was right there on the surface. Um, I think there was one moment where um, Carol made us a, a kind of creative suggestion in hyperphantasia, and I was just like, "Boom, that's it!" Um, and it was it was like the, to re to repeat the word "don't." <laughs> and I love that part of the book. Um, and it was just, you know, I, I really think that the synergy of whatever symbols or italics or kind of like systems that I am trying to design in the book, um, I, the, just these editors and like their poetic sensibility really resonates with, um, with that. And generating the book from a, a, a group of poems in my computer to uh, something that actually, you know, becomes itself in the process of, of editing. So I just wanted to piggyback on that for a minute. Um, the performance, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny on Zoom, I, I have a different performance, I have to kind of make it up. <laughs> um, but I, have also just had the chance to um, develop for both of the books, um, develop like these characters and um, all of the voices and sensibilities that like the the editors are helping me without needing to, you know, have super long arduous conversations about it, but um, helping me pull out of the text. Um, so, 
Babette was a sort of voice. Fanta is definitely a kind of voice. Um, and yeah, I mean, while I go through the kind of book tour or the, the um, series of readings that they set up for me, um, I have a chance to also generate um, the character of the book um, and let it kind of become itself and learn from um, the experience of of reading it out loud and and of um, I guess kind of interacting with the different communities and audiences that the press helps me um, connect with. So for this book, I think I did like thirty readings or something. <laughs> um, you know, just just so many. Um, and in part, that was because also, uh, well, we had we had kind of joint books that came out at the same time. Um, Adrian and I, Adrian Rafel, with our Dark Academia, which also has like all, so much performance inside of it, but like per, all the performances on the page, like they really took that book and allowed the worksheets and the dolls, and um, I know made the suggestion of like the the um, essay at the end, the Wikipedia entry to define the term. Um, so that book really became itself as well. Um, and yeah, I just from from like the beginning of when I sent these poems to uh, to rescue to where I am now with the book, it's kind of remarkable what has developed or been pulled out of it, both performance wise and on the page. So yeah, um, the voices, they, they, have, they have to be said out loud in order to develop. I think like the book kind of has to um, live in the world and like take on this new life um, and continue going through an editorial process of its own. Right, yeah, yeah, interesting. I uh, I was going to mention Sarah too about your book. The first time I saw you, you just you had mentioned that when you're performing on Zoom, you can't quite perform the way you normally would. And I wanna I wanna just revisit that because the first time I saw Sarah Reed, she was I was at the Downey Mansion in Chicago, and she was um, reading and walking in a in a square repeatedly. And um, I was I always think about that um, and 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 how you continue to perform and how the sense of not just the body in a space, but uh, the physicality of the reading and of the performance plays in. So that is one of the reasons why that hyperfantasia cover, which is readily indecipherable, um, is, is words as a surface, the, the, the titling and the author's name form a, a geometric shape with dimension. And it's set on top of this sort of phantasmagoric, um, again, sort of it's a, is it a sunrise? It is, a, is, it, is it a pupil? Is it a sunset? What, what is going on back there? But the way that um, the way that the, the performance of the work kind of had this additional visual element that was looped back into the design, I think that was particularly relevant in this case. Great. Totally. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to just say like that, that was so much um, collaborative work that I, uh, we were doing behind the scenes CV, like the the symbols that I use on the page and the the way that I specifically want it laid out, which fits with that idea of like moving around the room and all of those performance spaces that I had um, specifically for Babette, where I was really developing like a, a an idea of like being embodied in space um, in that Chicago mention. And then I went back to Chicago. I had like a 30 minute um, solo performance uh, at a different mansion. <laughs> and I think Rescue set that up as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, on the page, I mean, it's like, there's, there's so many choices um, and they drive me they, they really bring me joy and like drive me insane as well. And working with CV on that like interior space um, is so important to me um, and being able to, to collaborate like that. And to, and then to add one more thing on it, which is generative editing, generative publishing, but generative design where we always try, I always try to have each book have like this, I call it this first and second life. So there's this first life, which is why, 
I read that first manuscript cold and come up with initial ideas cold and then compare it to what the author says they want me to think or believe. Um, because we're first trying to determine what is someone who's reading this going to assume right away at that first two second glance. So that's the first life of that book. And then the second life of that book is specifically if, if it's, a, if it's a, an effective cover, um, that second life uh, is when you close the book, you finished it, and then you revisit the artwork and you realize that the decisions that were made have meaning and that they're rooted in the book. And you see that cover differently and hopefully you never see it the same way again. And I find that to be a, a, not only, like I said, a hallmark of an effective cover, but in Sarah's case, again, with Hyperfantasia specifically, I love that you look at this cover and it's just like, what is what on earth is happening here? And then after you spend time with the book, it becomes painfully obvious, as Sarah mentioned, that the word it's it's almost like it lives in a space and it's trying to ascribe its own dimension. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and now I think we have time. Just um, I'd love to touch on the flair. Uh, series and and hear about that and uh, I'm not sure who wants to jump in on that but feel free. Sure, um, I can and this sort of ties into a lot of what's just been said. Um, so one of the things we started with rescue obviously was trying to put books into the world, um, but over the last couple of years we've also been thinking critically about um, how those books can impact uh, the audiences and communities that that we. Um, know of and that and that we don't. Um, and so uh, another kind of element of community, um, Doug Powell was visiting the University of Iowa campus. Um, Doug is a dear friend to the press, uh, a teacher, a, a colleague, a friend. And Doug had read some poems uh, that he had not published. Um, and he had just sort of read them at a reading. And I said, man, those were amazing. Um, and a couple years later, maybe three years later, he wrote to me and said, if you want to do these as a chat book for rescue, you know, maybe we could do that. And I ca called CV, I remember. Um, and we had a long conversation about how we could do this in a way that would be really beautiful, uh, that would really do justice to the work, but also that would do justice for justice. So we could figure out ways of giving things back. So CV and I came up with this idea of, of flare editions, um, where where we could take work by an established author, short work, work that hasn't been published, uh, and put it out um, in a really beautiful way. And then the proceeds immediately go to a um, nonprofit or, or, or a program of choice that the author uh, has defined. So in Doug's case, he uh, decided to work with uh, Youth Speaks, which is a wonderful organization out of San Francisco. Um, and so CV created this template. There's some photos of it on that slide we saw earlier. Um, that allows us to work with different uh, long poems, short poems, uh, narrative, uh, prose. Um, and so our plan in the future is to have more of these come out to, again, reach a wider audience. Um, and then through the reaching of that audience, give something back to the communities where those authors um, believe that their needs and, and interests lie. Um, and so we hope to have kind of more of these coming in the future. Um, but it couldn't have worked without, again, community at first, Doug being kind and sharing that work and, and trusting us. Uh, and then also CV's vision and idea of community and thinking about how the book as an object um, could be something that would make people want to hold it uh, and make people want to connect with it. That book has what's called a belly band, this piece of paper that goes around it, and it's water. And you actually remove the book from the water, you sort of rescue it. Uh, and then you open it up and we had a long conversation about the color palette. There's a sunrise on the interior. It's really gorgeous. And it's a small book, uh, but the care and, and um, uh, thoughtfulness that CD designed it around connected with, in this case, the work of Doug and future authors uh, as well, I think really makes it something really special. So be on the lookout for more information about Flare Editions soon. Oh, That's a lo lovely, lovely idea. Uh, and again, just the way in which the press is sending tentacles out and creating a network of interlocked communities is, is really lovely. Um, looking at the time, it's probably time to go toward the um, Q&A. So uh, Eleanor, do you want to take over? 
Yeah, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been super inspiring and just really great to learn more mm. about rescue. So thanks everyone for your contributions. Um, our first question will be from um, Nuzat and I will ask on their behalf. Um, as someone who's just started a press, I'm curious how you funded it at the beginning and even now. Yeah, um, I can speak to that and Danny, feel free to jump in. Um, we funded it at the beginning stupidly, <laughs> which was that we were both adjuncting and we just put our money into it, um, our little tiny bit of <laughs> extra money into it. Um, but I should say that, you know, that our budget, which was small, that directed the press that it became at the beginning and i'm i'm glad for i mean you know like yes i wish that like one of us would have married rich or like we would have you know fallen into a million dollars or something like that but having being a little bit scrappy from the beginning it set some parameters that um have carried us through until now so we are not a rich press um we're an editor um, run press and no one, you know, makes a salary. This is all volunteerism, like is the case in so many small presses in America. Um, this is a, you know, one says a labor of love. Um, so we, we sometimes contribute to it ourselves, but basically once we got up and running, you know, the money we needed at the beginning was for print runs. We just did all the rest of the work ourselves. Um, and we, you know, we found friends who could contribute. And really, it was the print runs that cost us something. And over time, our book sales now fund the press. Um, occasionally, we get donations from lovely readers such as maybe yourselves <laughs> that make a huge impact on what we do but mostly we're just kind of like floating along um you know if we have more or less money it just that directs the amount of books we publish in a given year so you can see you know how how that works out um in the press itself yeah we, and I'll, I'll, oh I'll go I'll just say we're not a nonprofit. That's something that, you know, we think about now and then, but we, we don't really have um, the administrative desire to do that there. You know, it's just like, no one really wants to be doing that kind of continual paperwork. Maybe we should, maybe we will one day, but for now we're just, um, we're mostly funded by our book sales. Go ahead, yeah, Danny, sorry. I was just to say the same thing. We're not a nonprofit, but we operate um, very much in that basis. As Carol mentioned, we're not uh, taking any money from this. So all the work that you see from our press is done like on our lunch breaks at night, uh, on a weekend, uh, through long Zoom calls, uh, through our colleagues and friends. Um, uh, a lot of help. Um, CV is a great example. Uh, CV, if you can believe this, uh, started with rescue. Um, I think maybe in your freshman year at the yeah. University of Iowa um, as an intern uh, and now basically is my boss at Rescue. Um, and, and that comes from us, again, in community, just like Mark trusted us with that first book, we trust a lot of people to come under this umbrella. And so I was fortunate to meet CV. He wanted to design a book. He had great design skills. And I said, go for it. And he worked with an amazing poet named Phil Sorensen on Phil's first book and has just done everything for rescue ever since. And that's the idea of, of trusting and believing in the people you surround yourself with. Um, and so because of CV's great work, he also built us a new website, which then allowed us to sell more books, uh, which then brought in more money so we could make more books. Um, but to Carol's point, we were very silly when we started this because we weren't necessarily thinking long game. Uh, you put out a book in the world, you want to keep it in print, you want to keep it going, you want to have money to send it places. When we made that print run, um, we probably couldn't have sustained it if we weren't behind a really great book in Mark Ray's first book, The Smaller Half. And because that sold enough, we could ship the book and we could take on another book, which sold more. And so we, we were 
sort of silly in some ways and really smart in others. And I, I will echo that scrappiness that Carol mentioned. Um, because of that, I think we've been able to do some really great things. We haven't ever had to really say no to an author aside of maybe they wanted like a hardback gold leaf debossed cover. But even that CV could probably figure out a way around it. Um, but it's just, it's put us in a position where, where we can support our authors across the board and um, really make great decisions. And one last thing I'll say is again, just also being able to reach out to our community of, of partners, uh, talking to people who would say, oh, talk to this lawyer because he'll do it pro bono to help you with contracts. Uh, all that stuff saved us money because we had a community around us to support us. And I wanted to be fair to the press as well and say that Rescue was an early adopter of independent e-commerce. So we did get up and running with our own website that has never really broken in for since we've since we've been using it um, for a long time now. And I think that that's been a huge help and not only being direct to you know reader and not having to go through a you know Rescue still goes through distributors, but it's always had a really robust independent. Uh, web presence. And I wanted to underscore that is probably part of the formula. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was a really great question. And our next question will be from Chloe. Thank you so much for this conversation, which has been just so rich with ideas. And it's been really special to hear about the story behind Rescue Press. So thank you to all of you. Um, my question is, what is unique about Rescue Press being located in the Midwest? Um, you know, what do you feel the cities that Rescue Press works in brings the press and brings you in your everyday work? Um, this is like such a good and such a large question. And I'll take a stab at it and you all can jump in. Um, this is something that we talk about a lot, you know, privately. <laughs> we're like we're interested in this answer as well. <laughs> and and maybe we'll have have it one day. Um I think that one sort of like generic maybe beginning to an answer like that is is less the particulars of our Midwestern place and more a somewhat like friendly uh, resistance to the idea that one, though I love everyone on this phone call, has to live in Brooklyn to do this kind of work. Um, and, and has to kind of, and and the small presses in particular can exist anywhere and everywhere and in fact in multiple places so you know um Alyssa Perry and I and the two open prose editors live in Cleveland Danny lives in Iowa City um CB lives in Chicago and at different times you know we've lived in in uh, Milwaukee or Madison or you know around the Midwest um and so we have never done this work in the places where where this work has historically most often happened. And so it's nice to, I, I feel like moved by the idea of it just existing sort of um, in a place where you might not otherwise find small presses. Um, just the same way that it feels really special to me to encounter a place like, I mean, we mentioned Woodland Pattern, but we could also talk about Prairie Lights, these like really special independent bookstores, um, you know, in little towns or little cities in the Midwest. I think probably, you know, a, a lot of us, um, well, the four of us here, Alyssa, me, Danny, CV, you know, we also all grew up and have lived a lot of our lives in the Midwest. So there are probably like personality traits that <laughs> I don't know, you could all tell us about that we have that have to do with being from the Midwest and maybe always wanting to be a little friendly and social or something about it all. Um, I don't, you know, does anyone else want to jump in? I, I love this question, although I feel like I'll spend my life answering it. I think, Carol, I think you did a great job, Andrea. And the only thing I'll add um, as just a plug to 
Iowa City. Uh, Iowa City as, as sort of a Midwestern space that all of our editors have spent some time in uh, growing up around the space, being here for graduate school, undergrad, whatever it might be. Iowa City as one of our base locations is also just a very special place for literature. And we're really lucky because those writers come through Iowa City, whether that's to give a reading, to teach. Uh, and that means our community is always growing. There's always a new writer, a new um, teacher, a new book that shows up at Prairie Lights. And Jan, one of the wonderful owners of Prairie Lights, will come over and say, Jan, you have to read this book. And that becomes someone that we reach out to for a blurb. It really sort of grows out of the ground here in a way that I know when we were in Milwaukee, it was something we were missing. To circle all of this back, it's why we started Rescue. Because when you leave a place like this that you've been invested in and a part of in such a, a, a very intense way and you go away from it, it's harder to find it in a city that doesn't stake uh, its flag as a city of literature um, at the writing university. Um, and so I, I think we're really fortunate to be uh, here as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. And then my final note will be, because it's a great question and I've thought a lot about it, a, 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 a sort of personal observation I think I've had is Midwestern weather um, puts me in a mood to always be changing and doing something different. And I think that that's not a coincidence that that's what Rescue's whole sort of philosophy is, is to always embrace the next thing. I think that has actually a lot to do with your climate and what climate you live in. <laughs> I loved all those answers. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. That was such a great question, Chloe. So integral to Rescue Press. Um, I think I'll turn it back over to Cole to introduce the reading. Okay. Um, what a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Really fun insights and backgrounds and perspectives. Really, really appreciate it. And so now we'll close with a reading by Carol. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this was really lovely. Uh, all the questions were great. And feel free to, you know, be in touch with us. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of little poems, maybe three of them from my new book. It's called um, Free Clean Fill Dirt and it's poetry. And this book sort of has a handful of very long poems in it and then a bunch of little guys. So I'll read from those and they all have the same title. They're called Ordinary Strata and um, they're, they're very loosely thinking about um, the experiences maybe of a single specific place through many different times. So they're called strata poems. Ordinary strata, Lake Erie. In every living thing is stuff that now is lead. Plastics, opioids, pesticides, estrogen, News of a stabbing in the parking lot, unconformity or trauma in the same line. Lives are made of a few things, retold. Dream of the taco boat. 52% of men think birth control doesn't benefit them. Ordinary Strata, Lamberton Road. Mushroom prints on the internet ad for Congress in the party lawn, waking up early like you said you would, burnt sweet potatoes smell, new homebrew discussing its man again, guilt for ignoring the summoned stews, winter insisting woof woof come too. Ordinary Strata Lake Superior. Glaciers pressed the sandstone cliffs. They made all this. How the grand lake mouths the land. The lake spells no thing. A child will be earth before their diapers are. What did that man close the window about? 
a thousand plastic cars adrift. Maybe I'll do one more little one. Ordinary Strata, Cleveland. Chimney too old and corroded to be usable. They told her, don't let it go to your head. Egg sandwich with tomatoes and cheddar. Looking through an archway at the angle of a window. Satchel snoring on the kitchen rug. What is it possible to pause for? Inquiry of interruption. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, and thank you also to Danny and Sarah for your readings earlier. Um, this has been so, so lovely. Thank you to the whole group, Danny, Carol, Sarah, CV, and Cole. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program, to make these daily conversations possible and for supporting our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our work. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Pio Abad, Camille Hoffman, Emmy Catedral, and Jessamine Batario on the event of Pasita Abad, Colors of My Dream at Tina Kim Gallery. We will conclude tomorrow with a poetry reading by Lewa M. Taitano. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. And again, thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Fong, as always. And thank you, thank you. Rail team, fantastic yes. Rail team for making it all work. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you. That was so brilliant. Thank you, you guys.